lot about the history, uh, and then we're learning about things as they come up, and you know, they face problems and come new solutions. Uh, so, brief little uh, reminder. Before the like 15, 1600s, we talked about all the pre-modern stuff. So all those little innovations from barter to trade to uh, <clears throat> minted coins to checks and banks and all that stuff. And then around the 15 or 1600s, we start getting some new uh, ideas, right? We start having uh, commercialization, so selling things for profit. Uh, they start ending uh, some of those limitations you had for class, the Enlightenment in the West. Uh, you also have exploration, a lot of new goods coming into uh, Europe. You have new ways of investing, right? You have um, uh, joint stock, what else we talked about? Uh, corporations, lots of innovations like that, <clears throat> which is great. And we start the commercial process, and then Adam Smith comes up with his theory, um, and we kind of start what we know as uh, modern. So this is early modern. And I'd say around the mid 1700s is when we have this shift to modern. All right, so here's where we get the, and this by the way was mercantilism, but mercantilism. Right, the fixed wealth, lots of tariffs. I don't want to buy stuff from other countries, I want to make it myself because I need all the money. Then Adam Smith blows this whole thing up <clears throat> for modern economics. He blows this whole thing up with his ideas on capitalism and wealth creation through labor. Says we don't need guilds and tariffs. People will provide stuff because they want to make money, because they are uh, they want to help you, and they're also selfish and want to profit. <clears throat> but here's the problem. Before we figure out how to make stuff really cheaply, it's obviously super expensive to make something. So let's take one example. Uh, let's look at um, textiles, because this is the first industry that's really going to explode. And I mean in a good way, by the way. Like. Uh, they're gonna figure out how to really make this stuff cheap and uh, make the world a lot better by getting out a lot of quality, well, high enough quality shirts uh, and clothes and blankets and whatnot uh, at a really low cost. So, <clears throat> textiles. How they did this was they basically took um, two features, which are the factors of production, which we talked about already, at least in the jigsaw. And that's, of course, the land, labor, uh, capital, and enterprise. All right, they took these four features and they condensed them. They made them as cheap as they could at the time. Uh, and that's gonna drastically reduce, reduce the <coughs> cost of production. So I wanna talk about how for a second. <clears throat> They're gonna make it way cheaper for people to buy stuff, all right? So I'm talking factors of production making something, uh, these all contribute in some way. First, I need somebody who has the idea and the bravery uh, to go out and start a business, because they're taking a big risk. Um, if I'm gonna go out and start a business, I don't mean just like I'm making videos in my home for almost free, I mean like I wanna build a factory and make shirts and hope that I make enough money to survive. What's the risk there? What are my risk factors? What, what happens if I fail? <clears throat> no one buys these shirts and you lose all your money. Yeah, okay, good. So these are the entrepreneurs, right? The guys that go out, or girls, entrepreneurs. Uh, they're the risk takers, and they are starting um, the uh, industry, whatever it is, the business. And here's the risk. I'm putting in my time and money, right? If it fails, I just lose those. They're gone forever. I might get some experience and be able to do something better later, but I lose, all right? Am I just losing my money? No, what else could I be losing? Your investors' money. Your investors' money, absolutely, okay. So that would suck for my investors. Uh, but hey, it wasn't my money, why would I care if I lost my investors' money? Well, they could, maybe. That means. But, um, they, but they know the risk too. If I say I'm gonna do this thing and you give me some money to help start, you know you're risking it as well. But like, what happens if I lose your money? You can't like come after me per se, because that was part of the risk. But what, what, how does it still affect me negatively? Because um, if other people <clears throat> heard about you know what happened, then they won't be able, to, or they wouldn't want to invest into you. The next exactly time. right. They know I failed. I'm less likely to get people to help me out the next time, right? So I lose my money in time. If I lose investor money in time, people are less likely to invest uh, in my idea later. All right. And if I borrowed money from a bank, 
right, as a loan, now I'm in debt, right? So I lose my own, my own money, I lose the, my reputation uh, for other investors potentially, uh, and if I borrow money as a loan from a bank, uh, I now lost that and I'm in debt to the bank. I might have to declare bankruptcy, and then no one's gonna give me loans um, for a very long time once I've declared bankruptcy. If you guys don't know what bankruptcy is, by the way, it's when, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys ever saw The Office, where, where uh, does anybody ever see The Office with like Steve Perel? Okay. Uh, that was, uh, I know people do, I have no idea if, if high schoolers do or not. I know people in my generation do, and older. <clears throat> did, did you know, by the way, that's like, a third of all Netflix minutes watched is like The Office or something ridiculous. But with all their stuff, almost everyone just watches The Office. Anyways, uh, they, he was told about declaring bankruptcy when you uh, can't pay off your debts. Like your, the debt's way higher than the money you have that you can pay off. And so uh, his accountant's friend told him to declare bankruptcy. So he went around saying, I declare bankruptcy, just telling people that. He's like, you can't just declare it. It's a statement, <clears throat> which means you uh, let your creditors know that you declare bankruptcy. So it voids any of the debt you have, but then you're like black marked uh, for a very long time. Like no one's gonna loan you any money for, a, for at least a decade probably. Uh, or if they do, it's gonna be really expensive for you to do that. Because if I declare bankruptcy, it's like, oh sweet, I have no debt. But it's like, uh, yeah, and now no one's gonna give you any money for a very long time uh, if you wanna buy a house or a car or something like that. All right, so there are consequences. <clears throat> and that's the kind of reputation. So you lose your money, you could lose the faith of people, uh, and you could potentially <laughs> declare bankruptcy, and then no bank's giving you any money for a long time. All right, those are huge risks. Uh, and in case you didn't know, even today, even today with uh, people being able to start businesses online for relatively low money, um, the failure rate is still about half by the five-year mark. So the odds that you're still in business after five years of starting a new business are about 50% chance of failure. And even in that 50% of people that's still there, 60% of that 50% are not making money. They're breaking even, all right? Only about, only a small fraction go to five years and are still making money. Uh, so it's not easy to do. <clears throat> okay, um, land, this one's easy. That's just the space that you need to lease or buy or rent, all right? Um, so, I don't, know if this is, I don't know if you guys know what leasing means, but what's that shopping center called over there with the Save Bar in it? Is there a name for it? Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know what I'm talking about. There's lots of stores in there, right? There's like Starbucks and then there's Masumi's and all that stuff and Milan Pizza and that. Um, did Milan's Pizza and Starbucks, yeah, actually Starbucks did, did Milan's uh, Pizza and all those places pay for those buildings to be made? No, they didn't. Somebody built those and they leased them, all right? So somebody else uh, makes the risk of building a shopping center and hope that stores will pay money uh, to go in and, and stay there. All right, that's why stores can leave, but that building stays. And you'll see it'll be another business in a few years or, or whatever it is if they don't do well. Uh, so that's the land portion. <clears throat> this is where uh, any physical space I need for my uh, uh, business, whether it's a store to sell things to people, whether it's a factory to make things, whether it's an orchard to produce you know, food, whether it's um, uh, an office uh, for us to... Uh, put our ideas on a paper or do our filing or whatever. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. So this is the stuff that you, uh, the stuff that we purchase, land, lease, or rent <clears throat> uh, for business. All right, that's expensive. This could be expensive, but this is more just a risk you take. These are actual costs, all right? And land can be a big one. It can be really expensive uh, to build a factory or buy land to put a factory on or to lease or rent a store location in a shopping center or an office building uh, or whatever. Uh, that's what skyscrapers work too, by the way. Um, when I was a kid, I used to think that like a company just built a skyscraper and that was their company worked. It's like, no, <clears throat> people put money together to build this giant skyscraper and then people lease the offices inside of it. So you can have companies coming in and out of those skyscrapers and the skyscrapers will stay there. <clears throat> All right. Sometimes the company will obviously put its name on the tower or whatever that built it, but other companies operate inside of it normally. Anyways, so that's obviously pretty expensive, and, and that's, that's a, a major cost, whether you're buying the land or leasing it, uh, a continuous cost that uh, impacts how much you charge for your product, all right? By the way, before I, no, I'm not gonna tell you. We're just gonna keep going. Uh, capital, these are the goods <laughs> the non-people goods that you use uh, to uh, make things, all right? So if I'm in a factory, obviously the machinery is gonna count, um, whether it's uh, 
trucks to transport things, or uh, um, what are those things called? Forklifts, um, tractors, any machinery at all, computers, any machinery at all used to carry out your business, whether it's making something or filing something or storing something, uh, that's the capital. Because you buy it and it gives you a value, right? Because I don't just buy a tractor to buy a tractor. I buy a tractor to make things, right? So I'm hoping to pay a lot of money for this tractor and in me using it, it's actually gonna make me money, right? That's why it's a capital or, or you call it an asset too. Uh, something that makes you money, that helps you make money, all right? And then the, uh, whoops, I put that in labor, my bad. Let me just switch these, capital. And labor's the easiest one to understand. That's the human uh, wage worker, human effort. Does it have to be like labor, like hammering things and picking things up? What else could it be? Typing stuff. Typing stuff, okay. What else could it be? Human resources, yes. Those are the people that manage your office. You guys saw some of that in the uh, business thing last week. If you had a sexual harassment suit uh, or disgruntled employees, they could help you out there uh, or help prevent it. <clears throat> what do you think, uh, is all labor, how can I phrase this? Let me frame it like this. If I get a job at McDonald's, what am I gonna be making right now in 2020 in California, starting out? 13 in this area? Okay. Depends on where you are in California. I guess in, in uh, San Francisco it's a bit higher. But all right, so for here in this area, minimum wage is 13. Why do McDonald's workers get minimum wage? Because they have over 25 workers. They require no experience. Okay. What, what did you say? They require no experience. It requires no experience. Okay. So you can just walk in and learn the job, right? Yeah. Okay. They start at 14 now. Oh, they start at 14 now. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so 14. Oh, well, that makes sense because it's January. It just, it just flipped over. Well, it's February now. It just flipped over. Yeah, so we all agree that if you go work at a fast food place or, or like uh, if you go work for Target um, or Costco or whatever, you're going to start pretty low, low wage, close to minimum wage, at minimum wage, maybe a little above it. Why is that? You already mentioned part of it. Any, you, can, you can learn it on the job. Why is it that uh, you make minimum wage going to work at a store, but you've got um, a principal that makes... $200,000. Why is he getting $200,000 and you're getting $20,000 a year? Because he has a degree on the job. Okay, he has a degree, okay. I have a degree. As a teacher, how come teachers don't make uh, $200,000? How come teachers here, I think, on average, make like $70,000? So, like, in our position, we work teaching the low. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> There's a certain degree of difficulty uh, in managing an entire school with a district, absolutely. You have more responsibility. Uh, principals are here longer. They're certainly experiencing more stress on a daily basis. Uh, the decisions they make impact more people. So basically, as you go up, starting from minimum wage, in this case $14 in our area, in Lathrop, uh, as you go up to higher wages, what happens is the uh, difficulty increases, essentially, all right? The more money you get for your labor, whether it's mental labor, creating things or organizing things or producing things or you know pressing buttons on the cash register and handing them the paper bags uh, or flipping uh, burgers or whatever it is, the more difficult the job is and the fewer people that can do it, the more money you get essentially for it. All right, so labor can vary wildly, but uh, it, can be, it can go from seemingly cheap to uh, incredibly expensive, right? Why do lawyers get paid $300,000 a year? Some of them more. They could start. I could. I could. If you're a good attorney, you could go out and make that in the first few years doing that oh. without without all of that experience. Although the experience does help. Uh, because they're basically like uh, you're giving them control of like how do you say like like your life is like in their hands kind okay. of. Okay. Their like job is definitely important, right? We yeah. said for doctors too, in different ways. Obviously, a lawyer and a doctor can save your life in a different way. But yeah, a lawyer could potentially keep you out of prison yeah. or keep you from paying a huge fee uh, or could uh, win your company a bunch of money in a lawsuit or protect your company from losing a bunch of money in a lawsuit. Uh, and it's really hard to do. They have to know all of the rules. They have to look at all of the evidence, which can take uh, years, depending on the case, to, to gather. 
Uh, and then they have to try to make a case that's better than the other attorney who's doing the exact same thing. Right? So that's why it's a really, really, really hard job. You gotta be really smart, really dedicated, really organized, uh, you really gotta know your stuff, and you're going up against other people that have those same uh, credentials. All right? So it's a very difficult job, and there's a lot at stake. Same with doctors, right? A doctor screws up, it could ruin your entire life, could kill you, right? or cripple you, or whatever. So generally, and it's really, really, really complicated. It's really hard to fix you, but it's really easy to break you. All right? So that's why those jobs pay so much more than, um, somebody who's you know, um, working at a fast food place or a retail store or something. I don't wanna say these jobs aren't hard though, by the way. You know how we know that being a fast food worker is not hard? Or sorry, it is hard? Customer service. Okay, that's true, customer service. Do machines do it yet? No, they don't. Why not? Because they can't yet. We have machines where you can like punch in your order and stuff. But they can't like, <clears throat> they can't look at a situation and, and alter things or uh, change the circumstance. All they know is what you put in and that's it. And they have to have a set limit uh, of options for you to choose. So we have not yet got uh, technology that can do the difficult task of dealing with novel scenarios or weird scenarios. All right, we can tell a machine um, how to uh, take an order and maybe even potentially produce something Right? But we can't get them to uh, do anything outside of that rigid sort of set of requirements. So anyways, labor is the human effort. It could be physical labor, it could be mental labor, whatever it might be. What do you think, out of these three, is the most expensive cost for a um, producer? Land, okay. Capital. Capital, why do you think land and then why do you think capital? The land you have to get first, and so it's probably gonna be more expensive Okay, real estate can be extremely expensive, especially where you're, depending on where you're buying it. Okay, fair enough. Well, you mean like over time or just over time? Uh, over time. Oh, uh, labor. You have to pay people over time. Why is that? What'd you say? You have labor because you have to pay people every day. Yeah, you have to pay them every day forever, as long as they're doing that job. Right? So land or equipment might be really expensive today, but once I pay the land off, I don't have to pay for it anymore. In fact, they could technically make me money, right? Once I pay my equipment off, it doesn't cost me anything other than maybe like the gas or electrostatics to run it, which is very low. Uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, paying for itself. Uh, labor though, it, it never goes away. I've always got to, as long as humans are doing it, they'll always be doing it. And I've always got to give them money. Do I give them the same amount of money forever? Do you like get hired at age 18 and you have the same wage all the way till you retire at 65? No, I have to constantly increase it, all right? So labor is far and away uh, the most expensive uh, cost out of here. Now, again, a one-time purchase, uh, it could easily be one of these, uh, but over time, it's labor because you pay it forever and it scales too. Um, so the problem people had was, before we write this slide, <clears throat> these factors, let's even forget this one for now, these factors made it super expensive to make stuff. All right, the example I gave you was textiles, right? Making shirts and blankets and cloths and things like that. People need that stuff. They gotta stay warm, they gotta cover up, they gotta protect themselves from the elements, all that. <clears throat> But prior to the 18 and 1700s, it was super expensive to make a shirt. Why the hell is it so expensive to make a shirt? How do you make a shirt? Because all the resources and stuff on this for protection of the shirt. Exactly. Th these are expensive because you've got to get all the materials. So like, it's not like shirts are just sitting there waiting to be made. You literally can't grow them on a tree. You can grow the materials for them. I can grow the cotton or the wool or whatever, but I, I have to grow the cotton or the wool. That costs money. Somebody has to go get the cotton and the wool and bring it to me. That costs money. Then I have to take that wool and split it and separate it and spin it into thread. That costs money and somebody to do it. Then I have to take that thread and weave it together somehow. I don't even know how they actually weave this stuff, but they, they have to weave it into the shape of a usable object, whether it's a, a, a blanket or a t-shirt. Right? That costs a lot of money and a lot of time. And then they gotta bleach it or color it, which also takes plenty of time. And then they gotta give it to you, which costs money and takes time. So that whole process could take forever because they'd have to go from the farm, right, where they're making it, uh, and then give it to some lady or guy, almost always ladies because they have better fine motor skills and smaller hands. Uh, then somebody has to thread it. Uh, and then if you're lucky, that person can also weave it, but likely they're gonna take it to somebody else who has to weave it then to somebody else who has to uh, bleach it or dye it, and then uh, they could possibly sell it to you, right? And every one of those steps takes a new person, it costs money to transport it, so it costs money to farm it. 
Cost money to transport it. Cost money to thread it, to transport it, to weave it, to transport it, to bleach or dye it, to transport it and sell it. That's a super expensive, long time consuming process. That was all goods, by the way. It doesn't matter what you want to make. If you're like, hey mom, can you make me a shirt? Oh, that was, that was a process, all right? <clears throat> or if you want to go buy a shirt, that's how they made them. How could we make that more efficient? Because they figured this out in the 18th century and the 19th century. There's the first one, yes. The first way that they're drastically to make things cheaper, reduce the cost of production, is they're gonna take away a lot of this unnecessary travel. Could I put some of these things in the same building? Yeah. Definitely could, right? Boom, there instantly goes a lot of costs, right? I've at least put these three all together, all right? That immediately drops my cost production by quite a bit. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> could I make this, now that I have them all in the same spot, could I make that any more efficient or better? What else could I do? You got something? Oh, I gotta pay you for that answer. Oh, I owe Davis for a couple too. He had a couple good answers as well. Oh, I'm catching up. You had a good one. All right. What else could I do with these people that I put in the same building? Um, you could pay like the same group of people to do all three of the jobs. Or you're very close. Okay. I like where you're going. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold that for a second. What do you gotta say? I was gonna say assembly lines. Yeah, okay, you're, you're kind of talking a similar thing here, okay? Assembly line's a little bit later, it's like early 1900s, but you're absolutely right. I want to get these as close together, but I want people to specialize in them. So I don't want one person doing everything here, because that takes a long time to do. I want people that just thread all day, and they get really, really good at doing the threading, so they can thread really, really quickly, all right? So it's called specialized labor. So, put them in all one place, it's called the factory system. And I'm also gonna have specialized workers who are really good at what they do, right? And I'm gonna pay them a wage. Like, Here's whatever, an hour, just make a bunch of, uh, weave, uh, spin a bunch of thread, right? Then you just pass it on and it goes to the weavers who just sit there and weave and they get really good at weaving. Uh, and then of course that goes to the bleaching and dyeing, boom, it goes out. All right, cool, specialized labor. <clears throat> There's one more thing too that's really gonna make this much cheaper because they're gonna find a way to, because what I've done is I've, gotten rid of some of this land cost because I'm not having to travel as much. All right, they're gonna find a way to really, really, really cut down on the labor expense. How might they be able to do that? Children. <clears throat> what? Children. Children, okay, that's true. They do, they do hire people that are willing to work for a very low amount, that's true, like children. So you're right, that's one of the bad things we'll talk about uh, <laughs> next week. Because next week we start talking about it's been all positive so far. Next week we'll talk about like, hey, these are all wonderful ideas and they worked out well, but they had some negative effects. That's one of them. What else could I do to make my cost of labor go down? Well, when you think of a factory, you just think of people in a room making things, like weaving them with their hands. Machines, yes. That's what's gonna happen here. It's the process we call mechanization. All right. One of the first things they did this with were uh, water frames and spinning jennies. And you're like, oh, what the hell is that? You don't really need to know per se, but just know this. They found a way um, uh, using machine power and, and uh, technology, and their knowledge of physics and all that, they found a way to uh, put the, this wool or cotton in an area and uh, fix it into this machine and it would automatically thread a whole bunch at once. So it used to be, one lady would have to sit there and take the thread and, and put it all together, and you go to another lady who'd take those pieces of thread and weave them together. Now, I have machines that one lady can sit down and she can thread like 10 threads at once instead of just one, right? And then she takes those and they can weave like 10 or 20 of those uh, threads together uh, at once. So what just happened to my cost of labor? If one lady can do the work of 10 ladies now, it goes way down, right? So now instead of paying 10 workers, I buy a machine, right, the capital here, and then that makes my labor cost go way, 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 way down. Like potentially, you know, a tenth of what it was. All right? So that process makes it really, really efficient. There's one more I want to add to this. So they put them all in one place. They give them specialized jobs they're really good at. Uh, they make it much cheaper because they reduce the amount of people that need to make stuff. The last thing they do is, and this was a big problem, <clears throat> machines were super cool in the beginning. Whether it was a spinning jetty, or a water frame, or, or something that was powered by steam or electricity to make stuff super fast. If one part broke on it, that was it, man. 
I either had to replace the whole machine or I had to hire somebody to come down and make, make a custom part which was super expensive. All right. I don't know if you can imagine that, but if, I, if my car engine light goes on and it says, uh, you have a bad fuel pump, do I go, damn it, I got a new car now. Do I do that? No. Do I have to hire somebody to come out, look and pull it out and, and build me a custom fuel pump that's like $5,000 and put it in there? No, what do I do? You order like a part from online? Yeah, to the shop. exactly. I know this sounds super simple, but they didn't think of this for quite a while and when they did, it really changed things. They're called interchangeable parts. That means when they make a machine, they have exact specifications on the parts in it. They're a certain size and they all fit a certain way. So if one part breaks, I don't have to build a whole new machine or have a custom made thing. I just go get the part. I'm like, oh, this part broke. And I go buy it for cheap because it's mass produced. Uh, and then I fit it in there or pay somebody to fit it in there, like at a dealership or whatever. All right. So now the fuel pump breaks and it only cost me $100, $200, right? Which that's not fun, but it's not $5,000. It's not $30,000 for a new car. Um, so that makes this capital, the machines and all the stuff that they were buying, way more efficient. Because if they break down, I don't have to buy a whole new tractor, I just fix the part on the tractor that broke, all right, which is relatively cheap. So these four things all were developed in an era of time which you, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of in world history or AP or whatever. This is known as the Industrial Revolution. And they, they don't add the word revolution lightly. That means it really changed things forever. It made all of these factors cost way less money, all right? Britain was the first to do it, and other parts of Western Europe, then the United States, uh, was making textiles and other goods, later guns and cars and all kinds of crazy equipment, way cheaper than anyone else in the world could, all right? And that's what started this modern process. That's why we can go buy shirts and clothes and food for so cheap. Before it would cost you, um, you know, double, triple digits to go buy um, food items, because it just, was so expensive to do or any, any item you hear uh, that was like made by hand. Now they just mass produce them in factories with specialized laborers where, that are mostly replaced by machines uh, and if any parts break down they just swap them out for cheap with an interchangeable part. All right and then later they add the assembly line too which makes it even more streamlined. All right so the more stuff I can make at, at a lower cost if I lower how much it costs to make it I can sell it for less. And this is the last thing I'll say. How does it help you if I make my stuff cheaper and sell it for less? We save money. You save money, right? What can you do with that money? Spend, spend, more. spend it on something else, right? I increase your purchasing power. You could save more or spend more. You have the option, right? So uh, everyone sort of wins from this. And that's what companies are always trying to do. They're trying to look at their factors of production, whatever, whatever part of it they can, and they're trying to lower their cost of production. Because that gets you to buy more, uh, it gets them more business, and then it keeps the economy um, going, right? That's what we talked about. When people buy more stuff, then I have to make more, so I hire more people, so they have more money, so they buy more stuff. It's that wealth labor creation uh, cycle, all right? <clears throat> and that's how the Industrial Revolution uh, put it through. And next week, when we talk about, um, uh, after the unit test and all that, we're gonna talk about how this was all great, and it really helped the world out, but there were some negative aspects like the child labor and other things we'll talk about, monopolies and all that. <clears throat> Any questions about factors of production or cost of production? Do we all understand what the factors are? Okay. Let's find out if you do, actually. All right, easy Morgan bucks, hopefully. <clears throat> what are my four factors of production? Oh. Land, labor. No, you looked. <laughs> okay, sweet. And um, that's cool that I know that, but what am I trying to do with those things, those factors of production? What's my overall goal uh, as an employer, somebody who's making stuff? To make money off the thing you bought. Okay, but how would, I, how would I use those factors of production to do that? Or producing a good. What's that? Producing a good. Producing a good, but what am I trying to do with these factors though, always? What am I always trying to do with these factors of production? You're right, I'm using them to make something, but what am I always trying to do in my company to help my company out compared to others? Cut down on cost. There we go. You want to use them to cut down on cost production. Okay. That way I can sell it for cheaper and beat up my competition. So they started doing that in the 17, 1800s. All right. 
give me two ways they were able to drastically reduce the cost of production. Machines. Machines, mechanization, I wanted to though. Factory system, bingo. Factory system and mechanization. By the way, machines are better too because they don't make, make mistakes. People can like fall asleep, screw up. Machines don't, machines don't need brakes unless they're overheating. They don't need to eat. Uh, they just need their fuel supply. Uh, and uh, you can always depend on them. If they break, you can just fix them. People, they break, they gotta heal and all that. Uh, or maybe you can't fix them, depending on the injury. <clears throat> okay, cool. So we had uh, factory production, we had land, labor, capital, enterprise. And we're going to reduce those, which is the cost of production. And we got mechanization and the factory system to help do that. What's the other two? Oh, it's your money though. What's the other two that helped reduce our cost of production in the 17 and 1800s? What? They did what with land? Okay, that was the factory system. It does have to do with the workers, though. Do you remember what that was called? How they do the same task over and over and over? There we go. Specialized labor. All right. What's the other one? Interchangeable parts. What's that? Uh, if a part breaks, you can just change it. So, how does that help it? <laughs> it makes it easier. <clears throat> It makes it to where you don't have to replace the whole entire machine. There we go, because that's super expensive. Cool. And then this whole era in the 1700s and 1800s, when they're doing this and they're utilizing machinery and they're utilizing coal and steel, they're replacing people with machines which are way more efficient. They're putting them all in one location, making things way cheaper. What is that era called in which all these things are happening and it changes the world forever? It makes something cheaper for us and, and more of it? Industrial revolution. Industrial revolution, nice.